May I preach to you today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Long before I became a parent, I was fascinated by child psychology because there's so many different schools of thought about how children develop. You know, are they children or do we call them, you know, little adults? And there's various stages that they go through to demonstrate their, their mental growth, their emotional growth. But there's one stage that really caught my attention and I didn't fully understand it until I went through it. And even if you don't have children, you've been around children who've gone through this stage. It's called the It's Mine stage. And so there was a wonderful poem that I found that is entitled Toddler Property Law. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it just a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it just looks like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. And if you're playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. But if it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> and when I began to think about that, it really made me realize that there are some people who go through this stage as children and they kind of develop out of it and they learn to share. And then there are those people who go through this stage and never leave. For them, all things are mine. And I was thinking about that because of the feast that we celebrate today in the church, the feast of the presentation of Jesus in the temple. Now, we got a hint of this in today's gospel about why Jesus' parents bring him to the temple. So if, it's a little confusing, confusing because we've gone back in time. So if you've been following the gospel, Jesus has been born, the Magi have come, he's been baptized, he's called his first disciples, and now we've gone all the way back in time to when he's eight days old and being presented in the temple. So he's presented in the temple because it's written in the law of Moses that all firstborn male children are considered quote, holy to the Lord. Now, holy does not mean always what you and I think it means. When we think of something holy, we think of something blessed, something beautiful, something that we use in church, and that's a good definition. But holy also means something that is set aside for God's use or for being used in such a way as to glorify God. So when the children are set aside as holy, it is to say this child belongs to God. That is a heck of a theological statement for God to make upon children. Because I am conscious enough that as a man there is a distinct imbalance in the distribution of labor, no pun intended, when it comes to children. And I definitely remember this, uh, you all know Carol Burnett, and one of the things that she talked about when asked, what does labor feel like? And she told the man who had asked her, well, we'll just take your bottom lip and try to pull it over the back of your head. <laughs> and so to essentially instruct both men and women that children do not belong to them in the way that we might think is a great demand that God makes not just theologically but socially and practically. And so it's easy for us to kind of brush up against this and say, I don't know if I agree with you on this, God. But Mary answers that statement by being faithful to the law of Moses and by presenting Jesus in the temple to say, this child who you have promised that I would bear, that I could not have without you, Lord, I give to you. 
I give him to you. And the lesson that Mary begins to teach us through this offering of Jesus, her firstborn son, is that all things truly belong to God. We can be co-creators with God. We can participate in creation with God. But all things truly belong to God, even ourselves. And so what's the message that Mary receives when she presents Jesus to God? Well, Simeon gives a wonderful statement there because he's been waiting to meet the Messiah because once he meets the Messiah, he knows that his life and his work and his worship have come to an end. And the message that Mary receives is that this child that you present is going to be so wonderful, so amazing, so powerful, so greater than you can possibly imagine, that it will change everything in the world. So Mary presents Jesus, and God returns Jesus to the world greater than Mary could ever have imagined. So what's the lesson for us here today? The lesson is, is that each one of us is called to examine what God has given us, everything, including ourselves, and to ask, am I offering all these things to God? Because whenever we offer something to God, He receives it, He blesses it, He magnifies it, and He gives it back to us better than it ever was before. But we have to be willing to give it to him. We can't be playing, like that poem says, the game of it's mine. And there's a big temptation to do that. My time is mine. My money is mine. My home is mine. My talent is mine. My family is mine. Is mine. My church is mine. Mine, mine, mine. So we have to be careful not to fall into that trap. And there's wonderful examples of in the liturgy that we have in our own Book of Common Prayer that we do every single Sunday that is so full of meaning to demonstrate just how much we believe that we need to offer things to God. And it's during the offertory. So if you notice, the ushers will bring up bread and wine. And they will bring them all the way to the front. They're received and placed on the altar. And then the offering that we give as a community is also placed on the altar. So why bread and wine? Anybody here ever wonder why we have, why we use bread and wine? I'm the only one? Well, I'm, okay, last supper. There you go. Okay, see, see, she had the answer. You all just didn't say it. Okay. But think about why did Jesus choose bread and wine? Because bread comes from grain. Wine comes from grapes. We don't offer grain and grapes. The grain and the grapes are transformed, these gifts of God, through growth and agriculture. These gifts of God are transformed through our labor which comes from God, our talent to do these things comes from God, and we present God our labor and these gifts and say, Lord, these things that we've helped transform will become the gifts that we give to you. Take these gifts, transform them in such a way to be your son, that they become something for us which is so powerful, so amazing, so spirit-filled, that it sends us on our way with the food that we need for our souls to live. But our work is involved. And so when we offer bread and wine, we're not just offering the bread. We're offering the labor it took to make that bread. When we're offering the wine, we're not just offering the wine, the grapes. We're offering the work that our community did to actually present it to God. And that's the template, the example that we're going to be called to constantly give for the rest of our lives. So the question I want to ask us today is, what are we unwilling to present to God? 
Because all of us find ourselves being selfish in some way. No one is perfectly giving. So what am I unwilling to present to God that I'm worried that he's going to change it in such a way that maybe I don't want to give it to him? Am I worried that if I give my treasure to God, he might ask me to do something with it I don't want to do? Or if I give my time to God, he might ask me to spend it in a way that I don't want? Or if I give my heart to God, he might ask me to love people that maybe I don't feel like loving? And so that's the question that we've got to ask ourselves is, what are we holding back from God? Well, a good way to try to get over this is by offering the first thing that God gives to any human being, themselves. And so each one of us is called to offer God who we are. Now, the wonderful thing is, is that God doesn't care if uh, we're a little damaged, we've got a couple of scrapes and dings and bumps and stuff. God is really good at refurbishment. He doesn't care about if we're flawed. All he wants is to receive us. And so the first thing that each one of us should be praying for is to ask, how can I give everything that I am to God? An example of this is whenever I see somebody volunteering here at the church, either here on our campus or when we go to places like uh, Daystar or Salvation Army or the thrift shop or any of those places that I see people volunteering, I, there's something in common that I, I always notice. They're not frowning. They're not frowning. A frowny volunteer is a scary thing. I don't want to go there. But if you find yourself offering yourself to God, volunteering somewhere and doing something, you find that at the end of the day, you almost feel guilty in saying, I got more out of this than even the people that I helped. I actually had somebody tell that to me one time. It says, Father, you know, I worry that I think I enjoyed volunteering today more than anything. And I said, that's because you offered your heart to God, He received it, He magnified it, He blessed it, and then when He gave it back to you, it was so full, you had to share that love with everyone around you. And so that's the challenge I want to leave us with today. What am I holding on to so tightly that I'm afraid to give to God? And if I find myself holding on a little too tightly... Let me begin by first offering myself, offering my heart to God and saying, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do with this, but I trust you, I believe in you and put my faith in you, and I know that wherever you're going to lead me with what you give me will be something good, because that's the God who we serve, the one who creates loves, sustains, and ultimately is always with us. Amen.